In the throes of World War II, amidst groundbreaking technological advancements that shaped the face of warfare, one engineering marvel stood out, leaving its mark on the history of aviation, the R-3350 duplex cyclone. This seemingly unstoppable engine had a tumultuous journey, pushing the limits of what was possible and proving that innovation often comes at a steep price. So, join me as we delve into the dramatic story of the R-3350 and the aircraft that relied on it, uncovering the challenges faced by engineers at Wright Aeronautical and the brave B-29 crews who took to the skies, carrying the hopes of an entire nation on their shoulders. The year is 1936, and the R-3350 shares similarities with the well-loved R-2600, but its additional four cylinders mean a significant increase in displacement. The R-3350 became one of the first Wright aeronautical engines fitted with a Wright-designed gear-driven supercharger, which pushed the boundaries of technology at the time. But as they learned from Rolls-Royce's mistakes, the engineers made critical design changes that improved the supercharger's efficiency by about 81%. Unsurprisingly, when you start making engines ridiculously large, there's often the pesky problem of vibration. In the case of the R3350, this vibration from the crankshaft transmitted forces to the propeller shaft, which began causing fatigue failures. So with the war raging in the background, engineers were in a race against time to devise a solution, eventually incorporating additional counterweights, which stopped the vibrations. But the challenges didn't end there. Then. And perhaps you're noticing a theme here. Because the engine was so large, it began overheating. As it turned out, the R3350's cooling surface, though extensive, failed to provide enough surface area to keep the engine cool under high power climbing conditions. Fortunately, through extensive testing and redesigns, engineers turned to sodium cooled exhausts and unique front facing exhaust arrangements to solve the cooling problem. Initially, Bendix or Chandler Evans downdraft units supplied carburation but poor mixture distribution resulted in front cylinders running leaner than the rear ones. So, in a bold move for the time, engineers introduced direct fuel injection into the cylinders with two Bendix Stromberg 9 plunger units supplying fuel at a pressure of 500 psi. Bosch also developed a similar fuel injection system for the engine, and in 1945, direct fuel injection entered service. While direct fuel injection does not increase power, it offers greater safety from the induction fires that plagued the carbureted R3350s. Meanwhile, ignition was supplied by a single Bendix Centella Magneto mounted at the rear of the engine. Reduction gearing followed Wright Aeronautical's typical multi-pinion planetary setup, but numerous problems arose, forcing engineers to make last-minute adjustments to salvage their design. The mounting for the R3350 is unique as the engine is suspended from the rocker boxes. Although innovative, this design choice makes cylinder changes more difficult. The engine's potential inclusion of anti-detonation injection in the Boeing B-29 was ultimately scrapped due to weight and complexity concerns. Still, hindsight reveals this decision was a grave mistake, robbing the B-29 of an additional 300 to 400 horsepower per engine. The sheer scale of the R-3350 program was staggering. Imagine Wright Aeronautical constructing a brand new plant in Woodridge, New Jersey, dedicated entirely to R3350 production, while their Cincinnati, Ohio facility is entirely converted for the same purpose. But not even that was enough. Another plant, the Dodge Chicago plant, a division of Chrysler, also jumped into the fray, building its own massive new facility. Dodge Chicago went on to supply the majority of R3350s manufactured during World War II, totaling an astonishing 18,413 engines, compared to the 13,791 shipped by Wright Aeronautical. As they started tooling up even before the engine passed its type test, they faced a staggering 48,500 engineering changes, inevitably impacting production schedules and ramping up the pressure. Throughout the process of production, some of these major changes included second-order balancers added to the front and rear cam plates, improved cylinder baffles, and increased oil flow. These continuous modifications led to an improvement in overhaul times from 100 to 400 hours by the end of the war. Revolutionary manufacturing techniques were also introduced, such as shot peening of the connecting rods and high-pressure water-slash-fine-sand mixture polishing, which streamlined the production process. The engines also underwent rigorous testing from initial runs to disassembly and reassembly for a final test run, with power recovery being used throughout. 
During the war, all combat-flown R-3350s were rated at 2,200 horsepower. In extreme conditions, however, a war emergency rating of 2,500 horsepower was allowed, pushing the engines to their limits for desperate takeoffs on short strips. As the war raged on, the R-3350 program charged forward, relentlessly adapting to overcome its challenges and support the fight. Picture this. It's 1940 and the U.S. Army is scouting for a long-range bomber to dominate the skies. Five major aircraft manufacturers are vying for the contract, and all propose using the troublesome R-3350 engine, including Boeing with their B-29. The stakes are high, and the pressure is on. As new intel pours in from Europe and the Eastern Front, the Army's requirements change dramatically. Now they require self-sealing fuel tanks, armor plating, multiple gun turrets, and more. The game is evolving. Soon, Lockheed dropped out due to other commitments, leaving Boeing's B-29 and Consolidated's B-32 in the running. Boeing's B-29, originally known as the Model 341, became a cutting-edge aircraft packed with new features. After it was redesigned to meet the updated specs by the Army, it took on the new designation, Model 345. With the world's first pressurized fuselage, it maintained a cabin altitude of 10,500 feet even at 35,000 foot altitudes. It was a game-changer, also boasting the first-ever computer-directed gun sighting system. The B-29's airframe was also innovative, sporting a sleek laminar flow wing with an impressive 11.5 to 1 aspect ratio. Most of its systems were electrically operated, a signature of Boeing's piston-engine aircraft. In a departure from the B-17's design, the B-29's wing structure relied on its skin for load-bearing, boasting the thickest skin used at the time. Its state-of-the-art electrically operated Fowler flaps were also a first for precision ball screws, setting a new industry standard. The B-29's fuselage was built in five sections, featuring three pressurized compartments. A crawl tunnel connected the nose section to the aft section, while the tail turret remained isolated. An enlarged version of the B-17E's tail service loomed large, and the defensive armament was unlike anything seen before. The gunners, aside from the tail gunner, were also isolated from their weapons, shielding them from the intense recoil and vibration during firing. Four turrets, each mounting a pair of 50 caliber machine guns, adorned the fuselage, with two on the top and two on the bottom. Five sighting stations were strategically placed, with only one sight controlling a turret at a time. The B-29 was a paradigm shift, pioneering not only new power plants, but entirely new systems. Components were shipped from all over the U.S. to Renton, Washington, where five main production plants churned out the aircraft. But as the first flight of the XB-29 took to the skies on September 21, 1942, it was clear that the journey ahead would be riddled with challenges. Disaster struck on February 18, 1943. Boeing's chief test pilot, Eddie Allen, was flying the XB-29 prototype when an engine fire erupted in the Engine 1 nacelle. Though it was soon extinguished, another fire soon broke out in the number 2 nacelle. This time, the fire couldn't be controlled. The aircraft crashed into a high-rise building, killing Allen, his 10-man test crew, and 20 people on the ground. The tragic event grounded the B-29 program and all R-3350-powered aircraft just when the war effort needed them the most. A Senate investigating committee, chaired by Senator Harry S. Truman, was formed to get to the bottom of the issues plaguing the B-29 program. Their conclusion was that the R-3350 was to blame, citing cases of poor workmanship and inspection. However, the real cause of the XB-29 crash was far more sinister. Investigators discovered that the fire originated in the wing's leading edge, ignited by instrument tubing making contact with the exhaust system. A design flaw in the XB-29's fuel system allowed fuel to siphon from the filler cap into the leading edge, turning a small fire into a catastrophic blaze. A redesigning of the fuel filler system finally eliminated the problem. As the B-29 program struggled to overcome these hurdles, the fate of the war hung in the balance. The pressure was immense and the stakes were high. Would the B-29 and its R-3350 engines overcome these obstacles and rise to the challenge? Only time would tell, as the race against the clock continued in a desperate bid for victory. As the R-3350's engine development hit rock bottom, the path to reliability seemed long and treacherous. With countless engineering changes making logistics a nightmare, the combat version of the R-3350, the Dash 23, emerged as the savior for the early production B-29s. Wright Aeronautical Engineers feverishly investigated 82 engine failures between October and February of 1943. Reduction gear failures stood out as the prime culprit, leading to the incorporation of tighter tolerances for the pinion carrier. Another concern was overspeeding due to slow governor response times. 
modifications such as larger oil galleries and bigger scavenge pumps addressed this issue. Meanwhile, workers in Kansas toiled away in dismal conditions, integrating the latest R-3350 modifications into the B-29s. And as these aircraft entered combat from purpose-built strips in China, they faced even more problems. Overheating was rampant, making cow flap positioning critical, and early combat experience underscored the importance of precise engineering and maintenance. The first B-29 raid against Bangkok in June 1944 proved disappointing, with many losses due to mechanical failures. However, on Christmas Eve 1944, a new tactic was tested against a Japanese target at Hankow. Bombing at a lower altitude brought two major advantages, reduced engine problems and a higher bomb load due to lower fuel requirements. The capture of the Marianas in August 1944 provided an opportunity to build B-29 bases, easing logistics compared to operating from China. But the long perilous overwater flights to reach targets in Japan remained. Tactics shifted to using incendiaries instead of high explosive bombs, causing immense destruction in the Japanese homeland. More devastation resulted from these conventional raids than from the two atomic raids that would follow. In August of 1945, the B-29 Enola Gay dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and just three days later, Bakar dropped the second bomb. These attacks finally forced Japan to sue for peace, marking the end of World War II on VJ Day, August 15, 1945. Back at Wright Aeronautical, engineers continued to analyze the R-3350's problems, finding several causes for unreliability and overheating. Adjustments to cow flaps, thermocouple calibration, and damaged components all contributed to this issue. Furthermore, the rear row cylinders were particularly prone to exhaust valve seat erosion, leading to a scheduled maintenance program to inspect and change engines as needed. Leaking exhaust ball joints and insufficient cooling on the ground also plagued the R-3350. The introduction of propeller blade cuffs, shortened cow flaps, and additional cooling measures addressed these concerns. Improved cylinder baffle designs and lubrication lines also helped dissipate excess heat. As the war drew to a close, the time between engine overhauls grew to 400 hours, roughly average for a World War II combat engine. Despite its turbulent beginnings, the B-29 emerged as one of the most effective strategic bombers of the war, with 4,221 units built by the time production ended in 1945. The B-32 Dominator, new and powerful companion of the B-29. The Dominator, second American plane in the very heavy bomber class, is the equal of the Superfort in range, speed, and destructive capacity, although its 135-foot wingspan and 83-foot length make it slightly smaller than the B-29. In the shadow of the B-29, the consolidated B-32 Dominator fought for its place in history. Built with the same specs and power plants as the B-29, the B-32 was meant as a backup an insurance policy against the B-29's problems. But the B-32's journey was no walk in the park. In fact, it faced an even rockier path than its counterpart. With cancellation looming over its head like a dark cloud, the B-32 was stripped of complex systems like pressurization and remote-controlled guns in a desperate bid to survive. The engine nacelle design echoed the B-29, but with a twist. Dual General Electric Turbo superchargers were mounted vertically, but not flush with the nacelle. The XB-32's maiden flight saw it powered by R-3350-13s, and later, production models sported various R-3350 dash numbers. In terms of performance, it matched the B-29, but the similarities wouldn't save the Dominator from its grim fate. As World War II drew to a close, only 144 B-32s had been delivered, with few seeing actual combat. Their debut came late on May 29, 1945. After VJ Day, the B-32s were rapidly withdrawn from service and scrapped, even as brand new planes rolled off of the production lines. Meanwhile, the R-4090 engine, an oddity with 11 cylinders per row, emerged as another R-3350 variation. Rated at 3,000 horsepower and weighing 3,260 pounds, it rivaled early Pratt & Whitney R-4360s. But fate was unkind, and the R-4090 project was ultimately canceled. So what can be said? for the mighty R-3350, the largest production radial engine manufactured by Wright Aeronautical. Like many other aero engine programs, the problems were chiefly the time constraints involved. Amidst the time constraints and high-stakes environment, manufacturers were racing to deliver reliable engines capable of meeting the increasing power demands for faster aircraft. Challenges were inevitable as they ventured into uncharted territory at breakneck speeds. The R-3350 deserves recognition and admiration for the groundbreaking engineering achievements it represents. The fact is, at the time of its service, it represented the state of the art.